what's going on in the world and all of its machinations, its socio-political environments, socio-economic environments, and all that stuff. All of those changes and all of those gyrations going on and all the chaos that's being stirred up by the enemy. I listen to the voice of the shepherd. I follow him. I do his will. And I do it at the time and place in which he is prescribed. And if I do that well, then I will be pleasing in his sight and I will glorify him with all that I think and say and do. Now he's talking to those who are faithful to the Lord again. He says, I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will have no other mind. And then he says, but essentially mark my words, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Look, there is not going to be a slowdown of false messages, false messengers, lies that are going to come at you. That's not going to slow down. According to the word of the Lord, if you know the rest of what he says, it's going to increase, not decrease. The messengers of those lies are going to bear their judgment. God tells you what it is, and it's not pretty. But you will define your future and eternity by what you do with those messages and messengers. Very important. There are people who say, oh, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you even knew what that meant, you wouldn't even say it, by the way. But number two, that's exactly the opposite of what God says. He doesn't tell you to pick out the, the uh, bad parts out of the other parts that surround it with things that are plausible or good. It's not what he says. He says, throw the whole thing out. Because it's been sullied, it was the word he just gave me. Yes, it's been contaminated. How many of you, if you knew that there was poop mixed in with the brownie batch that you had there, would try to search through the brownies to figure out how to pick the poop out and eat the rest of the brownies? Okay, well then let's stop listening to people who tell us lies. Let's stop thinking that some of what they say is okay. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. In other words, if I tell you to just go do a ritual, just pray the prayer, well, then I'm not going to be persecuted for what I preach is the truth. Because the offense of the cross has ceased. What's the offense of the cross? Here's the offense of the cross. The opposite of the message. If you just pray this prayer, if you get baptized in our church, if you come to church and give money into our coffers, you'll be good. Jesus is going to, that, that's the evidence Jesus is good with you. No, not so. You see, he says, then the, the offense of the cross has ceased. What's the offense of the cross? You want to know what the offense of the cross is? It's not that Jesus died on it. That's not the offense of the cross. The offense of the cross is that you need to die on it. That's what people are unwilling to do. If you don't deny yourself, take up your cross and put your flesh to death and be alive in the spirit, you're not alive in Christ. And that's the offense of the cross. No, it's other people being offended by what is the cross. The person who's being told, look, here's the message of the cross. You have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and your flesh must be put to death so you can be alive in Christ, which means all that stuff you've been thinking all this time about how right you think you are and how valid you think your opinions are and how right your way of life is, that has to go. You need to learn all that from Jesus from scratch, from the beginning. That's the offense of the message of the cross. Because talking about Jesus dying on a cross is not offensive to most people. It's offensive to some religious minds who say that's the only way to the Father. That's a whole different subject. But to most people, the offense of the cross is you've got to die to yourself. 
Now, the theologians of the world will tell you that, oh, it's ridiculous that some guy could die on a cross and that would be sufficient to pay the penalty God would require of you of your sins. Oh, no, 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 there's a different way. <laughs> well, that's how it's treated, right? Even if they call him some valuable guy, like some of these major world religions call him a prophet, yet deny that he was the son of God, or deny, some of them even deny that he actually died. So, the offense of the cross is far more than just the fact that Jesus, who is the son of God, who came in the flesh, who then died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, rose from the dead, and is now ruling and reigning from his, the right hand of the Father in heaven. That's not the primary offense to most people. Primary offense to most people is the message of the cross is you have to take up your cross in order to follow Jesus. Your flesh must die. How do we know this? Well, let's just read on. And he tells us this in crystal clear format. I wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. So this is kind of a hyperbole statement about circumcision instead of just cutting off the, the foreskin. He's saying, I wish they would just cut the whole thing off and become eunuchs. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, liberty from those liars and the one they represent, Satan. You've been called to freedom from him. How do you maintain the freedom from them and him, Satan? By abiding in Christ. That's how. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. I just finished talking about that a bit ago. I don't need to go into it again. If you love Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you will, in fact, delight in loving and serving other people. And let me help you with something. Just because you make somebody's bed or make somebody's food or go fetch them something nice or do something nice or take them out on a nice date or buy her flowers or give her a token every anniversary date, whether it's birthdays or whatever else you want to call it, does not mean you're loving him or her or serving one another. Pardon me? Yeah, or serving God for that matter. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know what most people want to do? They want to say, well, remember that time I did this? Remember that time I did that? Here's why this is such a challenge for most people. Do you pay attention to your own life in that same way? I remember this time I paid attention to my own life. I remember that time I paid attention to my own life. Is that the attention you give it? Or do you really recognize and realize the truth of the matter is that every waking moment when you're conscious, you're paying attention to trying to figure out how you can benefit in life in one way or another, whether it's any host of things, because that's how you're tending to and loving yourself. And God says, he wants you to love other people with that kind of same mindset. With what kind of frequency? All the time. With what kind of priority? High, high levels. Not, you remember that one time I did this thing? Remember that one time I did that thing? Yeah, it doesn't add up that way. <clears throat> but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. So what's going to happen? I told you the story about how I was treated previously. You can only imagine what kind of disaster will befall the people who acted in such ways. And God's already said that such judgment is going to come upon them. He's called me to go on and do something else. I don't have to worry about the fact that I still suffer persecution because I teach rightly the word of God. I was there. God gave me that time. He's relieved me of that responsibility and sent me on somewhere else. So now I do this until he relieves me of this. And then I'll go do what he sends me on to do next. He says, I say then, now this is an imperative. It's an instruction. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Here's, here's 
the equation. If I walk in the spirit, I will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So therefore, God says, walk in the spirit. Well, what if I sin? You won't. If I'm walking in the spirit, I don't have to worry about that because the spirit's never going to lead me to sin. If I'm listening to the, word, the voice of the Lord Jesus and following him, I don't have to worry about if I'm sinning. I know I'm not. It's when I'm not walking in the spirit. I'm not listening to the voice of Jesus. Very easy for me to sin. It's only when you understand this can you understand so many passages of the Bible. For example, one of them, which is the child of God does not sin. It's one of the exclamations God gives to us in 1 John chapter 3. You know how many people have such a hard time with that? You know how many times they want to explain that to say something it doesn't say? If I'm walking in the spirit, according to God, I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I will do the will of the spirit of God. It's simple, simple math. It's really, it's really one plus one equals two here, boys and girls. Why is it complicated? Because we don't want to walk in the spirit. That's why. That's the offense of the cross of Christ. You see, that's the crux of the problem. What do you mean Dr. So-and-so could be wrong? Yeah, Dr. So-and-so is wrong. There's some really famous so-called doctors that were theologians that were big in the world. One recently who died, we discovered now how disgusting this person's life was. And how many, how many thousands, if not millions of people that guy was lying to for years and leading him astray. And how many people were covering for him all this time so that the power of the ministry and all the money that would flow kept coming. Look, you got to stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made you free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Tolerate none of that garbage. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That is what we call quid pro quo. Do this and that will happen. This results in that. However you want to say it. Walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lust, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They're in enmity with one another. They're battling one another. Which means they don't ever cooperate. And these are contrary to one another. Just as I said, so that you do not do the things that you wish. What is he talking about? So you don't do the things that you wish. In what context he's talking about? You've got to remember where he started with this statement. Walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So that you do not do the things that you wish. So that you don't do the things that your flesh desires. If you walk in the spirit, you won't do the things your flesh desires. Because you'll walk in the spirit. How do you do that? Not by accident. By purposefulness, diligence, vigilance against the attacks of the enemy and the lust of your flesh. Being on guard at all times against them. Listening intently, carefully to the voice of the Lord. And being careful to follow and walk in his light. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's how I know I'm walking in the light. From the light. If I don't care about this, I'm not his. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Refer to last week's discussion on what it means to be under the law. It does not mean... You don't have to keep any rules. That is not what it means. It means you're not condemned by having broken the rules. But now, guess what? That's if you're led by the Spirit. It's not if I prayed the magic prayer once upon a time. It's not if I was baptized once upon a time. It's not if I go to church periodically or even twice a week. 
It's not if I give 10% of my wages to the church. If I'm led by the spirit. Because any one of those things or collective of those things by themselves, apart from abiding in Christ and walking in the spirit, are filthy rags to God. How do we know if we're walking in the spirit or the, or the flesh? Here's the light shining on us now saying, well, here's how you know. Now the works of the flesh are evident. You want to know how you know? Here's what the works of the flesh are. And they're evident or obvious to anyone who wants to open their eyes. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. By the way, this word sorcery in Greek is pharmakia, which is where we get our word for pharmacy, for drugs. You want to talk about our illicit drugs in the Bible? This is one of those places that it's there. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and here's the catchphrase, and the like. It's never intended to be a complete list. He says, but you've got to understand, pardon me? Including but not limited to is exactly how he's phrasing this. He's saying, look, anything that's in this sphere are works of the flesh. So how do you know if you're walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit? Do any of those things describe you or anything like it? Do you have, what's that? If, it, if, you're, if you care at all about being a child of God, you should seek to want to know the answer to that, not be afraid to find out the answer. Not to be resistant to the light shining on your life, showing you the answer. And if you really want to know, go find out from the people that really know you. So if you really want to know, you need to be exposed to other people and allowing them to speak into your life. And assessing what they say, not just reacting to it. Assessing what they say, because there's lots of people. The drunk will accuse you of being unloving. That doesn't mean you are. <laughs> so assessing carefully and seeing what the basis is of the perspective. But the word of the Lord is pretty darn clear. So in the story I told you earlier, those men that I were talking to, I would tell you are guilty of adultery, not because they cheated on their wives, but because they were cheating on the Lord Jesus. You see, adultery has both the near and far application. It has the terrestrial example of whether or not I'm faithful to my, in my case, my wife or her to me. But adultery is also our faithfulness to God, our faithfulness to the Lord Jesus. We've been betrothed to him. If we are his, as his church, will we be faithful to him or not? If not, we are adulterers and adulteresses. Read the rest of his word. He makes this very clear. Fornication. In a terrestrial sense, that'd be illicit sexual activity. Whether heterosexual or homosexual, it doesn't matter. It's still illicit. And in a celestial sense, this is us having close interaction with any idolatrous affair of any kind. So as Christians, that would be toying with other world religions and other practices and all sorts of occult things and giving credence to any of that stuff. That's exactly right. Uncleanness. Impurity. Wait a minute. Nobody's perfect. What he says here is uncleanness. If you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're walking in the spirit, he's cleansed you from all your old sins. If you're walking in the spirit. So you are pure. But if you're not walking in the spirit, you're still walking in the flesh. You're not pure at all. You are unclean. And you're mixing and mingling back to the poop and the brownies subject. 
I could put those brownies right in front of you. Unless I told you there was poop in them, you'd never know. Until you bite, bit into them, then you still may not know. You may not know until you have digestive reaction later and potentially biologic contamination. You see, that's how all of these deceptions work. It may not be obvious to you at the beginning. That's why it's so important to pay attention to the voice of the Lord Jesus and follow him because if you are walking in the spirit, you can't be fooled by that. Somebody brings to you a new idea and a new thought, hey, that didn't come from Jesus. I got to stay with following him. Why don't you take it up with him? Show me where he says that in his word. Lewdness. Idolatry. Sorcery, I just talked about briefly. Hatred. Hatred is not just how you feel about something, it's how you act toward others. How you regard others before you act toward them, right? How you think about them is where it starts, which makes you make a judgment, then a decision, then take actions regarding them, correct? You look down your nose at somebody, you're hating them. How can we say we love our brother, he says, and then say you'll pray for them, but then they're in need and you don't tend to it at all. You don't pay attention to it. How do you love your brother if he's in sin and you don't tell him? That would be hatred. Contentions. These are divisions within the so-called body of Christ or the church. Tells us in Corinthians, those divisions must exist so that those who are approved must be manifest. Why do contentions happen? Because somebody wants to promote themselves, their agenda, their way in some way, and they want to elevate themselves above other people. That's why it happens. Instead of simply just pointing to the shepherd and saying, we're following him. That's why we're doing this. Because he's the one out there in charge. Jealousies about other people's pos positions or provisions, status of life, health, skills, whatever. Outbursts of wrath. Somebody who is not self-controlled in their temper. Somebody who's not walking in the spirit. Selfish ambitions. But I want to this. But I want to that. Selfish ambitions. Simple. If you're not taking the time to find out what the Lord wants you to do and then be doing that, you have selfish ambitions. Simple. Dissensions. Heresies. Dissensions are essentially separating from one another. Heresies bring in false teachings. Envy. What somebody else has, not just the person, but maybe what their possessions are. Murders. That can be figurative or concrete. Actual murders, killing somebody in the flesh. But murders also is just hatred in your heart toward them as well. Wanting them to experience ill. Wish them destroyed in an eternal sense to be eternally separated from God for those who you have no good reason to think that of. There are people to have good reason to think that of, by the way. I'm looking forward to the day when God will make that happen between Satan and the world that I'm in. What's that? Yeah. Uh, drunkenness. You know how many people I've talked to that give it every excuse under the sun by why drunkenness is okay? I mean, here he says right here, if you're walking in the spirit, you will not be a drunk. You will not have drunkenness in your life if you're walking in the spirit. And according to him, that's a work of the flesh. So anybody with any amount of drunkenness is walking in the flesh, not walking in the spirit in trouble and are still under the law. 
condemned by it as a drunk. Revelries, self-serving, self-exciting parties and things of that nature of all sorts of loose and lewd behaviors. He says, and, and the like, and he says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, so my message isn't changing, it never has changed, and it never will change, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Does yours say unless they made a profession of faith at one time? Mine doesn't say that. Does yours say that? You see, that's what people want to read into the word of God. And oh, by the way, those of you that want to do that, I want to make sure you remember what God says in many places of the Bible, the last of which is in the last chapter of Revelation, when he says, if you add to my word, I will add all the curses in, this, in my word to your eternal existence. Not the promises of blessing, the promises of pain and torture and torment and suffering. I would suggest you don't add those things to his word. It comes with grave consequences. Those who practice those things will not inherit the kingdom of God, despite whether or not they had been running well before or not. Those who practice such things. Now, people want to say, well, practice, that means people who do it a lot. No, it does not. That's people who. Exactly correct. It could be a single event, and it could be the precipitous doing of the thing. It could be either one. So to say it only means the latter is a defense so that you can do occasionally what you want to do to walk in the flesh. Period. And think you've gotten away with it. Pardon me? Only takes once to be a murderer. How many times did it take Ananias and Sapphira to be liars? How many things did Achan have to steal? How many times did Achan have to steal to be cursed to death? How many insurrections did Korah have to bring before God killed him? How many times you want me to bring this up? How many people God did this to? How many times did Esau forfeit his birthright before he couldn't have it back? On and on and on. God is under no obligation that if you choose to walk in the flesh to continue to forgive you and continue to give you time. He may and he may not. According to him, he says he will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. That means I'm not asking your opinion. And according to God, he says, I'll do whatever I want. And I may give you one chance and I may give you a thousand. But you know who that's up to? Me. And if you're counting on me giving you a thousand, you are counting on the wrong hand. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, no matter what they call themselves, no, how, no matter how many times they go up and cry and pray the prayer, no matter how many times they go get dunked in the water, no matter how many times they go to the church or the gospel mission or beg for this or that, and no matter how much money they throw in the coffers, it doesn't matter if you're practicing the works of the flesh because you're not walking in the spirit. That's what God says. Now you can bring up all your but what ifs and but whatevers you want, but if it doesn't synergize with this message, you don't understand the other message. Because God never contradicts himself. He's never confusing. Ever. Ever except for those who choose to continue to sow to the lust of their flesh. Then it's really hard. Not only, not only is it really hard, it's impossible. Because if you choose to sow to the lust of your flesh, what did he just say? That's contrary to the spirit. You know what contrary means? The spirit's going that way and the lust of your flesh is going that way. That's what contrary means. It's not that... They're just slightly off, and they're kind of going this same general direction. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. In other words, you can't displease God ever if this is the fruit of your life on a consistent, constant basis. Why? Because those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let's look at the fruit of the Spirit. When you realize the bad news that you are lost and dead in your trespasses and sins, that you inherited the condemnation of the original sin of Adam when you were born through the womb of your mother. And subsequently, as you have grown, you have sown to the lust of your flesh, even from little childhood. And therefore are dead and lost in your trespasses and sins. And you have no hope of getting out of that position except God would rescue you. And then God provides the rescue. He does this by sending his son, Jesus, to come in the flesh and live a life just like you and I live, but in, this t in his life, walking in the spirit, not sowing to the lust of his flesh, doing the will of his father, not doing what his flesh wanted. And living a life in demonstration of a life that can be lived by walking in the flesh. Read the Gospels again and figure out how Jesus was doing all those things. How many times God says he did this and that by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit to go here and go there, to do this and that. Read it again with that in mind and you'll find a very magnificent opening of your mind in this truth. Jesus walked in the Spirit while he lived in the flesh. The very same way you and I are commanded to walk in the Spirit and fulfill the will of our Father in heaven. And because Jesus, who was the Lamb of God, who was given by his Father to take away the sin of the world, upon living that life in the fullest unto his Father, was then given over to torturers and his murderers that would put him to death, that would satisfy the righteous judgment of God on the sin of man for all those who would surrender to him. And God being so magnificent, despite the death of Jesus, in the flesh, three days later, he rose again in the magnificence and glory of God and is today ascended on high into heaven and ruling over all of his creation. And those who would choose to humble themselves as he did, making themselves lower than where they've ever had themselves before because their own opinions have been way up here about themselves, they'll just put themselves right down here and say, God, you know what? You're right. I need your help, and without you, I have no hope. So I surrender myself to you, and now I commit to being yours. Will you teach me? Will you show me? Help me to learn how to love you with all my heart and soul, mind and strength. Help me to learn more about who you are and your character. Help me to become the man or woman you have originally designed me to be for your glory, and I will live a life that is pleasing in your sight and beneficial to other people because I will purpose myself as I love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength to learn from you how to love other people the way you want me to. That's walking in the spirit. That's why the first one's love. And somebody who is in that position, despite real grief being in the world, real sorrow being in the world, real persecution and real suffering, will walk in the joy of the Lord. Doesn't mean you're always going to be laughing. But you will have the joy in your life of the presence of God in your life, the closeness, the knowledge, the confidence of not only who you are, but whose you are and what he has planned for you. And that gives you peace. Despite the chaos going around everyone else and everywhere else that is not abiding in Christ, you can have complete peace. Being totally settled with whatever happens to you is 
God's design for how he wants to utilize you in this world for the greatest glory that he can get. Okay, I'm good with that. And knowing that he won't disappoint me, I can be confident that if he decides to call my time in this life to an end because I get persecuted to the point of death, okay, then I get to go be with him. I get promoted. Long-suffering. Living in this body that is subject to decay, growing old, sickness, etc. Long-suffering with the conditions of the world being ruled by the prince and power of the enemy of God, the devil. All the corruption that goes on at all levels of all societies in this world. And even those closest to me who are choosing to walk in the flesh instead of the spirit. Long-suffering. Long-suffering does not mean compromising with sin. Long-suffering does not mean okay with somebody else's sin. Long-suffering does not mean I stop exposing the sin God reveals to me. Long-suffering does not mean I acquiesce to somebody else's sin. It does not mean I comport with their sin. It does not mean that I do nothing about the sin that he shows me. Long-suffering means that even while I am doing those things and that person's trying to kick me in the teeth for doing it, I continue to abide in Christ. That's what long-suffering is. Kindness. Kindness is not defined by the drunk who wants you to treat him or her a certain way. It's not defined by the thief who wants you to get, look the other way at their thievery. Kindness is defined by God and how to be kind toward someone else, whether or not they appreciate it as kindness. Whether or not they accuse you of being unkind. When you know what God has defined as kindness, you can do that every time despite the agreement of other people. Which is why you must be careful when somebody says to you, hey, you were being unkind. You must investigate. You must assess. You must discover if there's real truth behind that. Or is that just a defense mechanism for you to stop saying you're in sin and you need to stop? Goodness, doing that which is good. How do you know what that which is good? God's told us. If you don't know what God said, you don't know what's good and you can't do it. Here's the next one. Faithfulness. The fruit of the spirit is faithfulness. That completely turns upside down the, old, the whole, I made a profession of faith and I'm good forever comment. Any monergistic theme of God does everything and makes sure I make it despite my actions or my thoughts is completely thrown out with the term faithfulness. You see, faithfulness is a fruit of the spirit. If I'm walking in the spirit, I will demonstrate faithfulness to my Lord and Savior. You know, this is the exact same, no, before I go on to that, what does faithfulness, does it mean to you it's just something you think or something you do? Well, ultimately, it starts with thinking, but must produce the doing, right? So anything that does not produce the doing, would it be faithfulness? The answer is a no definition, except for the ones who want to make it up that way. Faithfulness requires the doing of that which you profess faith in. That's its definition. Okay? Now, here's a, a shocker for some of you. This word faithfulness, which any reasonable person will s include the doing of those works of faith, full of faith and doing the works of that faith you claim you're full of. Otherwise, you really are full of it. And it's not faith that you would be full of at that point. It'd be what we're going to take out of the brownies. This word for faithfulness in Galatians chapter 22 is the exact word for faith 
in Ephesians chapter 2, verses, verse 8. It's the Greek word pistis. Why is that important? Noah. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. I'm not sure what I said, but I'm going to say it again. The word faithfulness in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that is translated faithfulness, is the same Greek word that is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the word is faithfulness in English. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, almost every Bible simply says faith. You are saved by grace through faith. And then he says, and not of works, lest anyone should boast. That word for faith in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and faithfulness in, Ephesians, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, are the exact same Greek word. Wrestle with that for a little while. Because that makes it so that it's not just some phantom abstract thought that you can have that God's going to bestow upon you the grace of God and save you. And that's all you have to have at one point in life. And that no works that you ever do are ever going to have any impact on where you finally end up. And it's really important to pay attention to the rest of what he teaches here in Galatians 5 and 6 to have a grasp on this truth. So much so, he says, against such there is no law. If this is the fruit of what's going on in your life, how do you know somebody's broken the law? By what they think or by what they do? By what they do, by their actions. Okay? So to break a law, you have to do something. You walk in the Spirit, and this is the fruit of your life, you will break no law. That's what he's telling you. You walk in the flesh, you'll break numerous laws and ultimately be guilty of breaking them all. Walk in the spirit, against such there is no law. Walk in the flesh, condemned under the law. Try to mix and mingle them, you're a fool, and you end up walking in the flesh, thinking you can mix and mingle them, and you're still condemned under the law. Why would you be a fool? Because you have made your own way to Christ by doing that. Which means there is no God because you make yourself God. Jesus says those who come to him, hear his voice, and don't do what he says are fools. Read Luke chapter 6. Matthew chapter 7. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You know how many times I have people say, well, I'm trying my best, baloney. You want to know what God says is trying your best if you can't stop it right now by being diligent? He says, chop it off. Gouge it out. Cut it away. Really, if you're that weak, you really can't stop it right now, then let's get the machete out or the spoon or whatever it takes to get rid of whatever it is that's causing you the problem. Chop off your hand, he says. Chop off your foot. Gouge your eye out. Quit playing around with excuses. Stop telling us how hard you're trying and start doing. Any of you who have <laughs> had a spouse in your life how long do you think your spouse would put up with, honey, I'm, I'm trying to stop cheating on you. Just be patient with me. Come on, we're not that stupid. Yes, some people act like it when they have, talk about their relationships with God. I'm trying. And they want other people to capitulate with them, to agree with them. Oh, they're trying. He's, he or she's trying so hard. No, you're not. Stop it. There's an old comedy script that's out. I think I circulated a while back to some of you guys. Or I think it's an old Bob Newhart comedy script. And this person comes in for his counsel. And she wants to pay him for his counseling. And he says, OK, look, we're going to meetings usually only last about five minutes. And uh, you know, I'm going to require you to pay me $5. You have to pay it in advance. She tells him the story. He says, OK, I'm ready to give you my counsel. You ready for it? And she says, yeah. And he says, stop it. 
Yeah, she gets all offended. What do you mean stop it? Stop it. It's really simple. All this whining and crying about, oh, I'm trying so hard. No, you're not. Stop it. Walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you are Christ's according to the Holy Spirit, you have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That means that's not what you want to do anymore. You don't want to do what your flesh is driving you to do. You want to do what the Spirit of God is leading to you to do. And because you are committed to walking in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lusts and passions of the flesh. You've crucified them. Remember, crucified is the word he uses here. Before, when I was talking about the offense of the cross, I told you the number one offense to people of the cross is not that Jesus died on the cross, but that you must. The message of the cross is you must have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if you are his. Jesus said the message of the cross is if you are worthy of me, you will deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That's the offense of the message of the cross for most people. And if you disagree with it, you are not Christ's, according to the Holy Spirit's word right here. So how do we know who's a child of God and who's not? Those walking in the Spirit are children of God. Those not walking in the Spirit are not His. Period. Everything else is gobbledygook. Everything else is smoke and mirrors. And I don't care what they were yesterday or last week, last month, last year, 10 years ago. It does not matter. Right now, if you're not walking in the spirit, you're not his sheep. You're not listening to his voice and following him. And you are incapable of therefore loving God. You're demonstrating you actually hate him at the moment if you're not listening to him and following him. But furthermore, you're incapable of loving other people. You can interact with other people, but you cannot love other people according to God's design in a way that glorifies God instead of you if you are not walking in the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. In other words, you claim to be a Christian, prove it. Stop telling everybody that you are and start showing everyone you are so that it's so overwhelming, you don't have to tell anybody what you are or whose you are. It's obvious. Somebody who has to keep telling people they are is in an obvious position of defending an, an indefensible position of not walking in the Spirit, yet they want to claim that they are a child of God. God says not so. If you live in the Spirit, then also walk in the Spirit. You claim to be a Christian, then act as a Christian should. Follower of Jesus Christ. Listen to his voice and follow him. Love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength for the glory of God, our Father in heaven. And let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Conceited. You know what conceited is? What is conceited to you? Yeah, imbued with your own self-importance. You elevate yourself above all this stuff. Above everyone else, above God, your opinion is all that matters and all that counts. Yeah, but I think, but I want. Okay, you're, by saying and thinking in that way, you're demonstrating no thank you, God. I'll, I'll go this one on my own. God says, okay, that's the way you want it. There are grave consequences that come with that, but if that's the way you want it. No, 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 God, I want the blessings part. I just don't want the responsibility part. He says, those never were offered that way. Never. You're never offered a job without having to work there. Unless, of course, you're one of the corrupt people in the world. You can't have a marriage unless you invest in it, not just suck from it. This is what God's teaching us here. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you are a spiritual restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Wait, wait, wait. If somebody is 
overtaken in a trespass. Means you discover them in sin. Well, if it's not a child of God, just open your eyes. You'll see it all the time. But if it is a child of God, so the story of some people I was talking about in the past. Did Korah follow Moses out of Egypt? Yep. Did he follow him through the Red Sea? Yep. Did he go by the waters of Mirabah? Yep. Did he take the manna from heaven? Yep. Did he drink the water from the rock? Yep. But then he eventually stood against Moses. Did Achan cross the Jordan with Joshua and go into the promised land? Yep. Did he fulfill his responsibilities leading up to the fall of Jericho? Yep. What happened when Jericho fell? He fell into temptation. And he took the things God forbid them. Then took him back to his tent and hit him and corrupted the rest of his family and got the rest of his family to not turn him in, which they should have done. Or Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias they, owns this property with his wife. They sell the property. Shh, don't tell them how much we got. We want to keep part of this for ourselves. We're going to tell them we only got that much. She says, oh, okay. You know what she should have done? Not on your life, man. No, 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 no. We sold it for that much. You tell them or I'm going <laughs> to. But that's not what happens so much. We give in and agree. Well, I just don't believe like you, so I don't have to do what God says. No, 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 you don't understand. In my house, we will serve the Lord. If you will stay in my house, you will serve the Lord. I can't make you believe him or believe in him, but you will do what he says in order to stay. Me and my house will serve the Lord. We can work on your belief or your unbelief, and we will diligently and faithfully until you either tell me to go pound sand and depart, because I'm not stopping, or you're going to realize the truth and delight in the presence of the Lord in your life as well. One or the other will happen. Because when the light shines, either you appreciate it or you run like a cockroach. One or the other. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Bear one another burdens. He's talking about while we are striving in this time against all the pressure that we have walking in the spirit, we are going to experience consequences. Tribulation in this life, persecution, suffering, decay of the body, growing old, loss, grief. That's going to happen. He says we are to support one another who are walking in the spirit when they get that load. That's what bearing the burden is. And so you know what we do? We pick up part of the load with them. We find out from our brothers and sisters what's going on in their life and what do they need and how, we, how can we be helpful. We might be able to be helpful just by hanging out with them. We might be able to be helpful by actually lifting something. We might be helpful by donating time or money or, or skill or experience or wisdom or whatever. This is what he's talking about. And he's saying, look, if you think yourself all that, you better have a second thought. You too self-important to help people bear their burdens? Wait till you have one. We need to be purposing to find out, brothers and sisters, what our burdens are of one another, figuring out how we can really help one another. Now, this is not the world's way of tending to all of this homeless nonsense and drug abuse nonsense. That is not what he's talking about here. He's talking about people walking in the spirit who now have a burden, who are suffering because of the word of God, and we need to help them. He previously talked about somebody who was walking in the spirit and fell into temptation, into sin, and we need to restore that person in a spirit of gentleness by the prescription God gives to us. He is not enabling people to continue to be rebellion in rebellion against God and telling him it's okay by feeding their rebellion. That's never approved. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. You are not going to get credit for somebody else's faithfulness to God. 
You know, this was a huge eye-opener for me when my mother died in 1996. Before that, I assumed my mom is this great Christian lady. That means I'm okay with God. Believe it or not, that was one of the thoughts I had. You know how God cured me of that thought? Removed her from my life with colon cancer at 56 years old. And now I'm sitting there floundering <laughs> and I don't have that person in my life anymore. Now what was I going to say? Now what was I going to do? I floundered around for a few more years until I humbled myself after almost completely losing my entire family and decided to surrender to the Lord Jesus and learn from him. That's a whole other journey that would take a lot longer to describe. Examine your own work. The Lord says, examine yourself and return to the Lord. Lamentations 3.40. You know how many few people are willing to honestly examine themselves? Go stand in the mirror and actually honestly describe what you see, what you know you think, what you know you do, what you know your priorities are, what you know your perspectives are, what you know what motivates you really in life. Be honest with that person staring back in the mirror because that's God shining a light on the truth of the reality. And if you're one willing to be honest, the exercise is futile. But if you're willing to be honest, you might be surprised at what you learn. Then go stand in front of your spouse and ask the same questions, and your kids and ask the same questions, and your closest friends and ask the same questions, and then collectively put it all together and see what you find out. Examine yourself, he says. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. You know, this is an interesting thing. This is how some people in the past have really tried to amass great wealth for themselves. We've made some real rock star pastors, preachers, whatever you want to call them out there. Here's the thing you got to remember. The two principles once again. If you're doing what you're doing to get something, you're in the wrong place. If you're doing what you're doing because you've received something and you're grateful and you're demonstrating that gratitude, you're in the right place. Listen again to what he says. Let him who is taught, that can't exist unless you have been taught already. You've already received. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Think about this. The Lord requires tithes from people. He tells us very clearly he doesn't require them because he needs the money. Good golly. Anybody who says, well, gosh, Jesus doesn't really need the money, so I'm not going to give, has the entire wrong perspective. You see, this is a test for what you believe about what you have received. How valuable is it to you? How important is it? How grateful are you? You know how you're going to demonstrate that response? By things you do. And one of those things is, listen to what he says. Let him who is taught the word share in all things with him who teaches. Now that second hymn could potentially be capitalized. If you've been taught by the word of the Lord, the truth of the matter of life, then why would you not give to the Lord what he requests of you in your tithes? What would stop you from holding it back? According to his prescription, by the way, not according to your own. So you don't just get to make up, okay, I think, it, you know, this is enough. What has God said is the right demonstration of gratefulness. If you are going to meet a king and the king said, this is what you must wear and this is what you must bring, otherwise you get no meeting with me. Would you still show up without wearing that and without the proper gift? It's important that you understand these things. What does it test or demonstrate? Your genuineness of your faith and gratitude for what Jesus has done. That's what, it, that's what it's all about. So look, in my position, God has taken really good care of me, and I don't need more money. I'm not starving. I'm not homeless. I'm not destitute. 
nor am I about to be. That's not what this is about. And those of you who know me know that I haven't taken a penny of ministry work that I've ever done for many years. That doesn't change the principle. You don't say, well, well, since Todd doesn't need any money, I don't have to pay attention to that part. Oh, no. Au contraire. All of it is God's word or none of it's God's word. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. That's not just money. That's how you're doing at home with your spouse or kids or at work or with friends. Sharing in what is going on in and through you in life by walking in the spirit is part of what you're going to be sharing in that we can rejoice in together. Pray about together. It's more than just money. Say your new blessed attitude is another one, right? So he says, share in all good things with him who teaches. You know how many people say they go to church, or maybe they do go to church, and don't ever really give a response to the one who's teaching them, except maybe a fiver in the, in the till once in a while? How does that come anywhere close to what the Holy Spirit just said? I am not going to police your lives. If you ask me for help, I will help you. But I am not going to come chase you down. This is not other sects that say, give me your tax returns and I'll tell you how much of a check to write to us. Not doing that. If you're not intrinsically motivated, I am not going to put a noose around your neck and haul you in. It's not going to happen. But be careful to pay attention to the very next statement. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. You know how many people think they can just ignore these principles and just do their own thing, go away? What does God say? Don't be deceived. Where's that thought come from? Deception of the enemy. That's where it comes from. Do not be deceived. Whatever you sow, that you'll reap. You sow to your flesh, he says. He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption of mind and body and soul and spirit. But whoever sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Wait a minute. When I prayed the magic prayer, I got everlasting life that I can't lose. Not according to the Holy Spirit right here. If you're not sowing to the Spirit, you will not reap everlasting life. And by default, then you are sowing to the flesh and you will reap corruption. There are only two roads. Jesus describes only two roads. One's very narrow, and few will find it, and one is wide, and most people go through it. And if you're looking for the popular way, you will not end up in a good condition. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Sowing and reaping are agricultural terms used for a metaphor here. It's no question you've got to sow the seed to reap the crop. And some crops take a lot longer than others. But pay close attention to the principle because otherwise you're going to be found as one who is deceived, not walking in the spirit, claiming to be okay, but having been deceived is not being okay. That's the claim of the devil in the Garden of Eden. Ah, oh, God didn't tell you the truth. You're not going to die. Really, what God doesn't want you to know, you eat that fruit and you'll become like him. He didn't want that to happen. And according to the word of the Lord, Eve was deceived. 
Very important to understand this principle. And let us not grow weary, verse 9, while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. I stopped counting a while ago how many conditional statements and how many conditions there are to continuing on unto eternal life and abiding in Christ faithfully therein to actually receive well done and good and faithful servant, now enter into eternal life and be in the presence of God. There's a whole bunch of conditions in here. Here's another one of them. Let us not grow weary while doing good. He said you ran well. While you're running the race, don't grow weary. Weary of what? All the pushback from the world and the enemy. The headwinds. The head pressure. Don't grow weary. Keep running the race faithfully in the spirit. Don't grow weary. What do, you, what do you do while you're running the race? You're doing good, according to verse 9. Not thinking good. You're doing good. For in due season, the principle of sowing and reaping, in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Guess what happens if you do lose heart and you rest on that ritual you did of the tears in the prayer once upon a time or the baptism that you went through. Or some of you think that when you were baptized as a baby, that's good enough. If you're resting on those rituals and you're not walking in the spirit, abiding in Christ, you have abandoned Christ. You have become estranged from him. You have fallen from grace and you have lost heart and you will reap corruption. Therefore, given the law of sowing and reaping, he says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's where your priorities start. God, household of faith, lost world. Very important. So if you are, in fact, supporting the righteous works of the true church of Jesus Christ with your time, energy, finances, prayers, etc., then go off and do that in the world. If you're not doing it in the church first, forget doing it in the world. That's just a, a fantasy that you're doing anything any good. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Lots of people with great, entertaining, polished presentations and shows. Great actors out there. And some of them are really popular. And they've got all sorts of accolades from universities and groups of people and all sorts of things. And then you find out the truth because you pull the curtain back. It's the Wizard of Oz all over again. Be the one who pulls the curtain back. Don't wait for little Toto to do it. Get to know the real people, the real circumstances. Be careful who you listen to because there's lots of people who want to put notches in their belt, brag about how big their congregation is, get you to send them lots of money to build their own kingdoms, all while leading all of you to, off the cliff. Just like the swine who had been filled with the demons. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. My desire is not to do the things of the world. What's going on in the world and all of its machinations, its socio-political environments, socio-economic environments and all that stuff, all of those changes and all those gyrations going on and all the chaos that's being stirred up by the enemy, 
I listen to the voice of the shepherd. I follow him. I do his will. And I do it at the time and place in which he is prescribed. And if I do that well, then I will be pleasing in his sight and I will glorify him with all that I think and say and do. I should have no other goal. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. When I prayed that prayer, if I didn't become a new creation, I didn't have any value in the prayer. If when I got baptized, I didn't become a new creation, I have no value in the baptism. If by going to church and even paying tithes and offerings, if I'm not being transformed into the image of Christ, I am not walking in the spirit. It's profiting me nothing. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them. What do you mean? Not peace and mercy. You know, you're not asking for peace and mercy on the people who don't walk according to the rule. That's right. People who don't walk according to this rule, I'm not asking for the Lord to give them peace and mercy. I'm asking the Lord to make them unrested, unpeaceful. I want them to become aware of their plight, their condition, their desperation, so that they will turn to him. Because if while walking in rebellion against God, they are at peace, what good do they have? What need do they have of him? It's a false peace, and I don't want them to have peace. So when I pray for people who do not walk in the Spirit, who have abandoned Christ, I don't pray for their peace or their prosperity. I certainly don't say, thank you, God, that you sealed them forever, and they're going to be with you in eternally in heaven. Never. My prayers are, Holy Spirit, press in and bring this person to the end of him or herself, no matter what it takes, before he or she is dead so he or she can turn to you in genuineness of faith that you might be able to save them, him or her. From now on, let no one trouble me. In other words, all these accusations, all this disparagement of my character and what I have taught, what I've exemplified, not letting it bother me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I've shown you how dedicated I am. You know what I've lived through. They're not going to dissuade me. So for you to come back and say, gee, have you changed your mind? <laughs> no. I bear marks in my life of how serious this is to me. You should too. Because Jesus tells us anyone who does the will of Jesus will suffer persecution, will incur tribulation. Not may. If you're not experiencing that, it's because the faith that you claim you've hidden under a rock. And you're so proud of it, you won't let anyone see of it. You're so confident in it, you won't show it to anyone. You're so attached to those and those things of the world that you're unwilling to have your light so shine before other people. Because if your light that you have that comes from the light has effectively shined in your life, then you will now become that lamp that he will carry around in the world and shine his light unto others through you. This exercise should be an opening of your understanding of what happens when the light from the light shines in your life or anyone else's life. This is why you can know someone even though you can't see inside their mind or their heart because the fruit shows you if they're walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit. And you know the ones walking in the flesh are not children of God. The ones walking in the spirit are children of God. Those who once walked in the spirit but are now walking in the flesh are not children of God, even if they once were. And 
by the mercy of God, not the guarantee, but the mercy of God, if this person would confess and repent and God would grant this person repentance, God's mercy can restore them to walking in the spirit once again. And they better do it before it's too late. The condition of being a child of God comes with lots of conditions given to us by God himself. And we cannot extinguish them from the rest of what he says and simply say, I'm living on the promises of God despite the fact that I am not living in the promises of God. I'm trusting the promises of God without trusting God because I'm not listening to his voice and following him. I had a man last yesterday that I was talking to tell me after I told him that his response of being so slow to take care of a significant sin in the life of his daughter that was demonstrating she has departed from Christ, he said, well, unless she publicly declares that she no longer believes in Jesus, I don't think she's died. I don't think she has abandoned Christ. And I said, where would you get such a, a ridiculous statement from? God says, if you don't walk in the spirit, you're not abiding in him. You're walking in the flesh. Anyone walking in the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. Anyone walking in the flesh, sowing to the flesh, will reap corruption under the flesh. Will become estranged from God. Will have fallen from grace. How many times does he have to say this? In such a short place. And I could give you probably at least a hundred more if you wanted to take the time. Why don't we listen? Because the message of the cross of Christ offends us. It's an offense to us. What do you mean I have to die, deny myself and take up my cross in order to follow Jesus? It's not what I mean. It's what Jesus means. And he said it. He said it very clearly. He said it very unapologetically. You either agree with it or disagree with it. But those are his conditions. And he's the only one with a gift of grace to save your life. There is no other option. So let's be people who walk in the spirit. You know how to stop sinning? Walk in the spirit. You know how to resist temptation? Walk in the spirit. You know how to solve the problems you have in life? Walk in the spirit. Feed on the word of God. Walk in the spirit. Be dedicated to listening clearly and learning from him and doing what he says. And you will have all those answers to all those questions as you continue to walk with him and grow in him. Anything that pertains to life and godliness, according to him, he will provide to you. What do you have to do? Walk in the spirit. Totally dedicated to him. Totally surrendered to him. And you can do it. Jesus showed us the way. We can follow him. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on our YouTube channel, XL for Christ. We hope you like and even subscribe to our YouTube channel for ongoing edification that you can gain from listening to the messages and hopefully diving further into the word of God to find out his truth. We also like you to visit our website at xlforchrist.org. This website talks about the discipleship process that we engage in with folks to help them grow in Christ. We hope you will join us in our endeavor to make disciples for the glory of God.